Mr. Governor of the U.S. Federal Reserve, Mr. Ambassador of the U.S. for Switzerland, Mr. Chairman of the Go Governing Board of the Swiss National Bank, distinguished guests, dear friends, welcome to a very special evening. On behalf of the Swiss National Bank and the Swiss Institute of International Studies, I am very proud to greet you all here at Zurich University. This is indeed an outstanding event. For the first time in history, we have the honor to receive among us Governor of the Federal Reserve, the Governor Jerome Powell. Thank you very much for your presence in Zurich, in Switzerland. We are more than honored and would like to give you as a present coming from our heart a big round of applause. That was pretty strong. Nobody should say that the Swiss cannot show emotions. <laughs> we also greet His Excellency, the Ambassador of the United States for Switzerland, Mr. Edward McMullen. Welcome, Mr. Ambassador. <laughs> Last but not least, We greet Professor Thomas Jordan, Chairman of the Governing Board of the SNB for eight years already, which shows Swiss stability at its best. Welcome back, Thomas. <laughs> What do we expect from today's evening? Well, It is no secret that not only the world's politics, but also its economics have seen more stable conditions before. And even if it is true that modern times are always changing, accelerating and challenging times, it seems that the last years brought us even more and new difficult constellations. The fashionable, even magic word is, of course, disruption. Referring to the field of economics and finance, how do we handle the complex architecture of interest rates? How can we stabilize and fortify the numerous centers of debt? Do we have to fear a new global recession, and if so, how can we manage to avoid another possible worst-case scenario? These and many other questions are, of course, prominently in the focus of the central banks. It is therefore of the highest importance that we have the opportunity to discuss our topics with the governor of the U.S. Federal Reserve. Jerome Powell is the 16th chair of the Federal Reserve, serving in that office since February 2018. He was nominated by President Donald Trump and confirmed by the United States Senate. Jerome Powell started his distinguished career by studying politics and law at Princeton and Georgetown universities. He moved to investment banking in 1984 and has since worked for several financial institutions. He served as an undersecretary of the Treasury for domestic finance under President George A. Bush in 1992, was a visiting scholar 
at the Bipartisan Policy Center and served as a member of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors since 2012. In short, we greet the man for many seasons and hopefully for many seasons more to come. Thomas Jordan studied economics and business studies at the University of Bern, completing his doctorate in 1993. He wrote his postdoctoral thesis during a research period at Harvard University. 1998, he became a lecturer, 2003, an honorary professor at Bern University. Thomas Jordan joined the Swiss National Bank in 1997. 2002, he became head of the research unit. 2004, he was promoted director and shortly afterwards appointed as an alternate member of the governing board. 2007, he was appointed member of the governing board by the Federal Council and 2012, he was appointed chairman of the governing board. Thomas Jordan is a member of the Board of Directors of the Bank for International Settlements, BIS, in Basel, of course. He's also the governor of the International Monetary Fund, IMF, for Switzerland, and holds also many other important positions. In short, another gentleman for all seasons. The format of our evening works like this. Jerome Powell and Thomas Jordan will discuss with my modest moderation the challenges and goals of the current state of the economy and of course of our financial systems and institutions. Be prepared. The two gentlemen will not solve every problem tonight. But you ladies and gentlemen, will certainly profit from their knowledge, their insight, and their responsibility for a hopefully safely balanced world, not only for the wealth, but also for other benefits of nations. Therefore, one also could say, by referring to a famous statement of a former U.S. president, not stupid at all, it is the economy and it matters. Thank you. <clears throat> now we proceed to these tables and we start the discussion. May I please beg you to come here on stage. He gets to keep his. Mm -hmm. That's not fair. Okay, it's not fair. <laughs> Here we go again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> we don't foster advertisements. Okay. Let's start with a relaxing question. What's your relationship with Switzerland? How do you perceive our country? Mm. Do you like, even love it? Do you visit it? Do you do sports, hiking, swimming here? <clears throat> the people are curious. That's a lot of questions. I could take a full hour uh, on that. <laughs> no, first of all, Martin, thank you. Thank you very much for your kind remarks, and thanks to everyone for your, for your warm welcome. I really appreciate it. Um, so Switzerland uh, is a place where central bankers come as a on a regular basis to Basel, and it's a place where we meet with each other internationally. We share very candid views and... Uh, as equals, uh, uh, person to person, we develop close personal relationships with other central bankers around the world. So it's 
absolutely essential in this, in this globalized world that we live in, that we have strong multilateral relationships like that, and they, they really come together importantly here in Switzerland. In addition, of course, I've, I've been to Switzerland many, many times uh, on vacation and uh, uh, with my wife and, and a long time ago as well. We were talking earlier, uh, 44 years ago was my first trip to Switzerland. And uh, we did not climb the Matterhorn, but we did visit Zermatt. But uh, you know, I know it to be a beautiful, welcoming place and a friendly place and, and a nation of, that, that with, with which we feel strong kinship uh, always. And of course, you made also contact with Thomas before. Yes. <laughs> there, there was that too. Very good. <clears throat> you started your career as a lawyer and later moved to investment banking. What prompted you actually to join the Federal Reserve Board and become an expert in monetary theory? So I, I'm a, I have had a varied career. I, I was briefly an attorney. After that, I was an investment banker for some years, and then I became a private equity investor for a large part of my uh, career. But I've also periodically left the private sector to do public service. And that's something that's more typical of the American system than I think of many other systems. And I think there's a great benefit to it. I think that private sector work can really inform uh, your, your role as a public servant and vice versa. So I feel very fortunate to have had that. The, the story of how I joined the Federal Reserve Board was that I, um, I got involved in the debt ceiling um, confrontation of 2011, and I worked very hard to achieve a resolution. This is, this is from the private sector. And as a consequence of that, I was appointed by then President Obama to the Federal Reserve Board, and then, of course, President Trump appointed me as chair in 2018. Did you ever regret to make the step to the <laughs> public sector? Never, absolutely never. never. No, it's, it is a great honor to serve, and in particular to serve at the Federal Reserve, which of course is committed to non-political uh, decision-making based on the best analysis that we can muster. It's, it's a great place that has a, a very strong ethic and very high morale among our people, uh, really because of that commi commitment to, to non-political public service. And very strong impact, of course, of the it's very important. Yes. Very important, no question about that. So let's go a little bit more into the details of our discussion of tonight. The global economy has lost momentum and it is set to grow at a slower pace this year than in 2018. What do you think may be the cause <coughs> of this slowdown weakness? It's also a question for Thomas. I shall start. Please. Okay, so <clears throat> with your permission, Martin, I'll start just by pointing out that the United States economy has continued to perform well uh, and is in, is in a good place. In fact, we're well into the 11th year of this expansion, uh, which began back in the second half of 2009. It's now the longest such expansion since we began keeping reliable records. Um, and the outlook, the most likely outlook for our economy remains a favorable one. Um, with moderate growth, a strong labor market, and inflation moving back up close to our 2% goal. All that said, there are significant risks, uh, and we've been monitoring those, including, as you mentioned, slowing global growth, uh, uncertainty around trade policy, and also persistently low inflation. I'll just talk, make a couple of quick comments on that. Mm -hmm. I think we're grow we grew at about 2.5% in the first half of the year. Um, mm. For the year, we'll be somewhere between 2 and 2.5%. Two and that's very much driven by consumer spending, which represents 70% of our economy. Consumer has been strong. The service sector has been strong. Um, the manufacturing, trade, and business investment side has been weaker and is, in fact, now sideways to slightly down. It's a smaller part of the economy. And, and by the way, that pattern of a strong consumer economy and a weaker manufacturing investment and trade economy is fairly common now around the world. Meanwhile, our labor market is in quite a strong position. We're, for a year and a half, we've been at, at half-century lows in unemployment. Um, we've got higher labor force participation. We've got wages moving up by so many measures that the labor market is in a good place. I think today's labor market report is, is very much consistent with, with that story. And we've got inflation moving back up to 2%. So overall, we're in a good place, and the outlook is good as well. I think part of the reason the outlook is good is that the Fed has, through the course of the year, um, seen fit to, to, uh, to lower the expected path of interest rates. That has supported the economy. That's one of the reasons why the outlook is still a favorable one, despite these, uh, these crosswinds they've been facing. So yes, specifically about gro global growth, 
The global economy has been slowing since the middle of, let's say, 2018. We see that continuing with China and Germany and the EU. Um, there are many factors that are, that are driving that. Uh, trade policy uncertainty is one of them, it, but it's not the only one. Uh, but trade policy uncertainty will be weighing on business investment decisions and that sort of thing. Um, so still, though, I'll just wrap up by saying we, we see the most likely case for the U.S. and for the world, too, as, as continued moderate growth. And as, at the FOMC, we're going to, as we move forward, we're going to continue to watch all of these factors and all the geopolitical things that are happening, um, and we're going to um, continue to act as appropriate to sustain this expansion. Thomas, do you share this perception? Well, very much, but let me say a few words about Switzerland. Please. So we are a small open economy, very open, and our biggest market is Europe, but the United States became a much bigger market for our export uh, in the last couple of years. So it's very important what is going on in the United States for us. So we are, obser we are <coughs> observing the situation and we are uh, seeing that the global economy is slowing down. Not that much in the US, but much more in Europe and also in Asia, and that has a big impact uh, also on Swiss export opportunities. So we see that the Swiss economy is still growing, but the pace of uh, growth is a little bit slower than it used to be. And uh, we have to take that into consideration when we are also considering what kind of monetary co conditions are, are appropriate. Next to the economic situation is, of course, the inflation. The inflation is very low. It's also low in Switzerland, and it's lower than it used to be in the past. So this is something that comes in addition to the slowdown that we are observing at this moment in the global economy. We are a little bit a price taker regarding the global economy. So we have little influence on the global economy. But of course, the global economy is impacting us a lot, mainly Europe, but also US and China. These are the three uh, big uh, parts, regional parts, that have a big impact on the Swiss economy. Could policy uncertainty, for example, the uncertainty related to trade policy and Brexit negotiations be playing a role in dampening global growth? So I think they are. I think that is, that is the case. Um, we've been hearing from um, our, our, we have a vast uh, uh, array of contacts within the U.S. economy, as you would imagine, and we talk to them every FOMC cycle, of which there are, there are eight every year. The reserve banks go out, and we've been hearing quite a bit about uncertainty. So for businesses, to, particularly to make longer-term investments in plant or equipment or software, they want some certainty be, that the demand will be there. They want the certainty that there will be growth and, and, and that their supply chain is secure. And I think we would never comment on, on trade policy. We don't do trade. It's not, there's not a responsibility of the Fed. But I think it is the case that uncertainty around trade policy is causing some companies to hold back now on investment. And so our obligation is to use our tools to support the economy. And uh, that's what we'll continue to do. Keyword. Recession fears, how worried should we be about an upcoming U.S. recession, given all the talk in the media? Do we see a particular shock that could trigger a recession? Yes, please. Yeah, um, so we're not forecasting or expecting <clears throat> a recession. As I mentioned, uh, incoming data for the United States suggests that the most likely outcome, outcome outlook for the United States economy is still moderate growth, a strong labor market, and inflation continuing to move back up. I went through the numbers. Uh, I'll say a little more about the labor market. Payroll jobs are coming in at well above uh, the level that new people are entering the labor market, and that means that the labor market is still, still tightening at the margin. Um, by so many measures, the labor market continues to strengthen. So the consumer's in good shape, and, and really there's, there's uh, our, our main expectation is not at all that there'll be a recession. I did mention, though, that there are these risks, and we're monitoring them very carefully, and we're conducting policy in a way that will, will address them. But no, I wouldn't see the recession as the most likely outcome for the United States or for the world economy, for that matter. Right. Thomas? No, our main scenario, our base scenario, is not one of a, a recession, neither for the global economy nor for the Swiss economy. I have to say that we have in 10 days our monetary policy meeting again, and then we will have a new base scenario, a new forecast. But l let me just come back for, for one second to the trade issue. I think this is a very important one, so especially for small open economies. The functioning of global trade is, is key. So we depend 
on the functioning global economy it's where it's possible to trade import and export and of course the uncertainty that is at the moment in the global economy is having a, a rather negative impact and we not only maybe the trade but also the brexit discussion is creating a lot of uncertainty so consumers and po also investors producers uh, uh, are unsure whether they should buy should invest or do anything so of course this creates uncertainty and has a rather negative impact at this at, at this point so from the point of view of a small open economy i think it's a wish to everybody in the world also to contribute to i think uh, a reasonable solution to these trade uh, disputes just a little additional question let's having a look at europe the european union do you still think this all fine there or do we have to see some uh, disruptions and problems in different states well, regarding Europe, so we are in the middle of Europe. We are not part of the European Union, but the economic integration is very deep with the European Union. So export and imports are big. So we export a lot, but we also import a lot. And it's of mutual interest to have here sensible economic uh, conditions. And of course, uh, every time the European economy is not growing, that has a big impact on us. So if Germany, France, or both together, and even together with Italy, uh, have a low growth situation or even a recession. This has a big impact on us as well. So we have a big interest in a functioning, well-functioning and growing economy in Europe. We are all in, 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 in interdependent, absolutely. <laughs> now, challenges facing monetary policy. The Federal Reserve, Governor Powell, is conducting a public review of its monetary policy strategy, tools and <clears throat> communications practices. What prompted you to conduct such a review? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, uh, the challenges that central banks face evolve over time, and sometimes they rise to the level where we, we need to um, assess whether our policy framework needs to be updated to, to deal with different challenges. A good example of that is after the great inflation period of the late 60s and 70s, um, central banks really didn't do a good job of getting control of inflation, but coming out of that came a new commitment to, to getting control over inflation, which was successful. And, and the, the framework of what's called inflation targeting. And I think we've had a number of decades now of, the, of uh, where inflation's been under control and actually other economic outcomes have been better as well. So I think if we look back now over the last decade, we again see a new macroeconomic landscape which looks like this. It's slower growth, lower inflation, and lower interest rates. And the implication of that is that Central banks will be close, rates will be closer to, closer to zero. Central banks will have less ability to support the economy in, in a downturn should one mm -hmm. come. And this, I think, is the, this is the main challenge for central banking now. It's the biggest challenge we face is lower neutral rates and, and lower inflation. And we see what's happened in, in, uh, in Japan and right. now to some extent in Europe. So we, we thought this was a great time to look at our, our framework and see whether we can find new ways to you know, to address that, new tools, it, it's new, a new, new strategies, tools, and communication. So we're also, I, I would say, a, an important part of it is we have, in, we have done a public engagement uh, to, at a scope that it really the Fed has never done before. The Fed's never done this kind of a public review before, so we thought it was an appropriate thing. So we've, we've had these meetings around the country, we call them Fed Listens events, and they're, uh, they're live streamed on the internet and we're meeting with community groups and labor groups and business groups and all different constituencies, not just academic monetary economists, although we meet with them too, of course. And I would say that the gains from that have been very striking. You know, you, we, we, um, it's, it's striking for anyone who's been to one of these uh, uh, events, you're really struck by how much people care, how important it is in their lives, what we do. So. And so to, to, just to get to, the, to wrap up, um, we're taking all of that and now we're having a series of meetings at the FOMC and we're looking carefully at, at our tools, strategies, and communications and we'll announce decisions on that sometime next year, but so far we think it's quite a healthy exercise. Going to the country, so to say, could also be a model for you, Thomas. What do you think about that for Switzerland? Well, you we do not have exactly the same exercise, but we have an ongoing dialogue, I think, with many, many groups in Switzerland regarding monetary policy and also about our monetary policy concept. But what we get as a reaction everywhere is that people like price stability. So this is our mandate, and this is given in also in the law of the Swiss National Bank. 
and nobody really complains about high inflation. So people want to have uh, price stability. And we have, and this is a little bit different than many other central banks, a definition of price stability that is rather a range uh, than a point target. This is important for us because it is rather difficult to steer inflation over the short to medium term exactly in a, in a very precise manner. But on, in the average or over medium to long term, inflation was very stable in Switzerland on average around 1% over the last 20, 25 years. So that was, in, my, in our view, a very big success. So we have, at this moment, very little reason to change that. Obviously, as uh, Jay mentioned before, <coughs> the lower, lower bond, the effective lower bond, not to have uh, the possibility to lower rates indefinitely is, of course, an issue. But uh, so far, we could circumvent that with other uh, measures in order to steer monetary conditions in a way to achieve price stability. Let's talk about the interest rate, a very important topic, <laughs> controversial too. It has declined substantially over the last two decades in many advanced economies. What are the macroeconomic implications of this decline? Yes, yeah, so, so I think um, really for tw the last 20 years, we've seen the, what we would call the neutral interest rate decline by at least two or three percentage points, and, and there are people making arguments that it's actually more than that. Um, <clears throat> and um, so why is that happening? It's, it's, uh, it's a lot of factors. It's, it's the aging of the population, which leads to um, a higher appetite for safe assets and more savings relative to investment. It's low productivity. Um, it's low growth. It's all of those things. And so you get in a world where... Um, the, the neutral real rate is low, but inflation is also low. And what that means, if you add those two together, you get the interest rate. So the implications are, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, central banks will have less ability to counteract the downturn by cutting rates. Typically, in the United States, since World War II, we've cut more than five full percentage points, or as we say, 550 basis points we've cut in a typical downturn. Now our, our, our federal funds rate is about 2.1%, so we won't have that ability here. So the implication, one implication is that we need other tools, and so when we got to the zero lower bound during the financial crisis, we used quantitative easing, and we used mm. forward guidance about the interest rate, and we feel that they worked, although are not perfect substitutes for, you know, for, for the interest rate. I mean, I think one, one essential f feature of this from our standpoint is not to allow inflation to move materially below target, because if that happens, then that will work its way into interest rates. So we're, we're very committed to defending the 2% inflation target on a symmetric basis. We've seen in low inflation become the case moving down, and you, you get on this, uh, you seem to get on this road that it's hard to get off of, and we're, we're, we're trying not to get on that road and actually defend our 2% inflation target where it is now. Thomas, your policy on that topic? Well, I think this is one of the absolutely key questions uh, at this moment. And uh, having this lower neutral rate is a difficulty for pension funds. So all these systems were built on higher in in interest rates. Uh, this is a real phenomenon, not only a monetary phenomenon. So it, we have these uh, difficulties. And it's very difficult to explain that to the public. So this is, uh, comes in addition. And, of course, the room of maneuver for central banks to react to certain shocks is smaller today than it used to be uh, maybe 20, 20 years ago. And as Jay mentioned, this means that central banks have to find ways in order to have uh, instruments available in case it's necessary to have an impact on monetary conditions. This is much more demanding than it used to be uh, 20 years ago. This is true. It gets more and more difficult or challenging, let's say challenging. Well, ch the challenge is uh, in, in a way that uh, we probably on a global scale is to some extent the normalization. So we went all the way down to zero, even negative, with the hope that uh, everything will go back at least to some normality, but that did not happen because of the, uh, the economic cycle and because inflation did not come back exactly as expected. And now we are a little bit in a new situation where on low level of inflation, already low interest rates, maybe some further instruments are necessary, and this is the big debate uh, that you just started. Keyword central bank governance. How do you, Governor Powell, coordinate when taking monetary policy decisions? 
So in the, in the United States, we're blessed with a, with a fairly large uh, committee. So um, as, as many of you will know, um, uh, at full strength, there are seven governors on the Federal Open Market mm -hmm. Committee. Those are all nominated by the president and, and, and confirmed by the Senate, and we serve 14-year terms. We also have 12 reserve banks around the country, and those reserve banks, uh, on a rotating basis, share five additional votes. So effectively, but when we have our meetings, you know, everyone has a voice at the table. So what that means is that uh, I, I talk to every other participant on the FOMC at least once per FOMC cycle, and that's eight of those a year. Um, I think that this arrangement of reserve banks around the country and, uh, and, and also the, the seven governors, it guarantees that we will have a diversity of perspectives around the table. Um, the, the reserve bank presidents are chosen by their boards of directors who are largely private sector people, but with the, with the approval of the board. And I, just, I think this system guarantees, again, a diversity of opinions. There's that, there's that risk of groupthink if everyone's in the same building and went to the same schools and took the same professors. We don't have that. We have people coming in every eight weeks with different views, and I have to say, I, I, am, I wouldn't have it any other way. I really do, um, I mean, I, I spent a lot of years, as I mentioned, in the investment business, and what you really want before you make an investment is to have the smartest person in the room try to explain to you why this is a bad idea. Not after you make the investment, but before. So, and I, I place huge value on that. So I, Mike, I have terrific colleagues on the FOMC, and, and I really do actually welcome all of that. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of consulting, but again, I wouldn't have it any other way. And it's the policy of convincing, right? Sometimes. So I, you know, it, it's, it, to a large extent, it's a, it's a policy of putting together a consensus. Um, so I, you know, I'm, my nature is to want to incorporate people's thinking and develop a consensus. Sometimes it's me convincing, sometimes it's me trying to move people into a group. But, uh, I mean, I think collective decision-making can, can work, and I think in our, our case it has worked well. Would you like it to have like this, Thomas, too? <laughs> well, every country has a little bit of different history and different institutions, so we are blessed in Switzerland by a small board. <laughs> 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 but a very well-functioning board. And I'm looking to my colleagues here. And the, the situation is a little bit different. So we have a lot of discussion also with our economists. So we have this uh, variety of views within the bank in any case. But Switzerland has also a tradition, not only at the Swiss National Bank, but also in the government, uh, both at federal but also at cantonal level, that you have a college and the college takes uh, together responsibility and uh, also try to find a consensus and tend to defend this view vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the, the public. And that worked over more than 100 years very well at the Swiss National Bank. And the, it also forces you to find a solution, even in difficult times. And uh, we are a small country exposed to these international shocks. So the, the governance that we have for our case, for, for, our, for our country, worked very well so far. And uh, it's really to find a consensus and then to defend this view vis-a-vis -vis the public together. And that worked well. And, and I'm personally convinced that and I do not speak for other countries, it's really something that is very specific, uh, should not be changed, and uh, it helped Switzerland, not only at the central bank, but also at the government, both at federal and cantonal level very well. True, no? Never change a good working system yeah, yeah. unless you see that you have even better options, but this is also risky. Could, could I add, so Please. actually, it's, it's the same in the United yeah. States. We, we had um, two failed central banks. Um, at the very beginning of the Republic, if you ever saw it, Hamilton, the, the, the musical Hamilton, that's the first one. There was another one, and they both, the, the second one died in 1836. And the difference was they were very much uh, East Coast based, and, um, you know, uh, and, and the rest of the country was sort of suspicious at, in those times about having power over money and banking concentrated there. So the, the beauty of our system is what I mentioned, which is we have reserve banks all around the country. And this turns out to be a much more balanced and sustainable uh, structure. We're 106 years old, I guess, now. And um, I, think, I think this, this, this federated structure that we have has served the, the, uh, the country well. And it's also rooted in our history, as you say. Mm. Crucial topic. Some have suggested that the Fed consider the impact of its decisions on the outcome of the two 20 
presidential elections. Do you consider electoral politics to be a new part of your mandate? <clears throat> absolutely not. Uh, political factors play absolutely no role in our process, and my colleagues and I would not tolerate any attempt to include them in our decision-making or our discussions. That's not our DNA. Our DNA is what I mentioned earlier. We're, we're strongly committed to non-political decision-making. We serve all Americans, regardless of their political party. Um, and it's just simply wrong. The idea that we would deviate from that is just simply wrong. And so the answer would be a hard no, let's say. Like in Switzerland. Yeah. We couldn't agree more. Mm. Digital currencies. Are central banks missing out on the challenges, but also the opportunities <coughs> represented by digital currencies? I, think, I don't think so, no. So I think, um, you know, of course we're following very carefully the, the whole uh, question of digital currencies. It's not something that we're actively considering, other central banks uh, more than we are. Um, and for us it raises substantial, significant issues that we'd want to see, you know, carefully resolved. For example, um, you know, the, it, it, if, if you think about one a, a currency that was for the United States or for, frankly, a multinational currency, it would really need to be cyber secure because, I mean, it's one thing to, to be able to counterfeit paper currency. It's another thing to be able to hack into a cyber currency and create with a computer however much of it you want. So the cyber issues are, are quite daunting. Um, mm. It's also not clear to us that there's really demand for this. So, you know, consumers have plenty of payment options. They're not clamoring for this. Um, I, I don't want to sound like I'm ruling it out, but I think there really are. There's another question, too, which is if people are leaving their money in a cyber currency and holding it there, mm. they're not putting it in a bank. What happens with banks is people deposit their money and banks lend the money out. So what will happen to intermediation, the whole intermediation process? What will happen if everyone's just, you know, investing in this, in this uh, cyber currency? So I would say... Look, we're in favor of, favor of financial innovation. We're, we're following this, these things very carefully, but we don't see cyber, we don't see digital currencies uh, from a central bank as something happening in the near term. Thomas, how do you see it? Well, we looked at that very carefully, and uh, we have a similar view, probably. So we do not believe that it's a very good idea to have a central bank digital currency for the public at large, exactly for the same reason. And we also have a very efficient payment infrastructure in Switzerland, so there's almost no advantage to make a payment with a digital currency, central bank digital currency, for the public at large. What may be a little bit a different situation, so if we have new financial market infrastructures <coughs> where banks, among them, trade uh, securities, and, and you, you need to also create some new money that comes from central banks that make this system more efficient. So we are looking at that very carefully, but this is not yet sure. So it's not yet sure whether new forms of securities are more efficient than old ones and whether this new infrastructure actually need digital uh, central bank currency. It's well possible that the link to the central bank may be as efficient as uh, today and, uh, and in this system. But it's a very important and very uh, interesting question, and uh, we're also happy to be part of this uh, BIS Innovation Hub that looks at those issues uh, uh, very carefully and uh, I think it's very important that central banks are aware, aware of all these uh, innovations and ob about all the possibilities. Absolutely, absolutely. What is your take on the Libra, the new Facebook currency with headquarters in Geneva? So um, I, I want to start again by saying that you know we, we do want to see responsible financial mm. innovation. We think that's key. We think that's, that will enable people to be better served and drive costs out of the system. So it's important that we be open to that. I think, as I've, as I've said before about Libra, um, the, with Facebook's very large network of more than a couple billion people, uh, a, a stable coin could be systemically important very quickly if it were to have wide adoption, and that's not a foregone conclusion. But because of that, um, we would think that, that, that Libra would need to be held to the highest standards. It could be systemically important right away, potentially. And because of that, it would, it would have to be held to the highest regulatory and supervisory expectations. It is 
it, it is um, not obvious to see how that would happen under our current regulatory system. Uh, so it, it's, it's the kind of thing where we've said this is not going to be a sprint to implementation. This is going to be a, a careful, thoughtful conversation about how, how we can do our job of protecting the public from cyber risk and, and all the other risks that, that come uh, with something that's systemically important. So if, if I take your answers all in all, you're quite optimistic. Is that true? Well, about, about things in general, yes. Yeah. But I would say... <laughs> About Libra. You always want to be an optimist, but I would say that I would say Libra will, has a, a, a burden of proof to carry. Again, we, we're not uh, we're not we're, we're not um, we don't want to just be an obstacle about this. But I think it's appropriate for us to say what we think our expectations will be, and appropriately so, they'll be very very high for something that could have such broad adoption, and and uh, they'll have to be met. And and so that's the way to think about Libra, I believe. Yeah, Murphy was also an optimist, as we know. Um, okay, thank you very much. I think we should open the discussion to a few questions. And I see some ladies and gentlemen who would like to ask one behind there. Far behind the second row. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Powell. Welcome to Switzerland. Uh, I would like to know what you think, um, because the market, is, the, the, the market is widely expecting some accommodation. Do you feel like meeting that accommodation will be enough to support the economy, or do you feel like you might need to do more to, um, to, to provide that accommodation? Just answer directly. Please. So I, I'm just going to go back to what I, what I said earlier, which is that we're, we're watching all of these developments, you know, the geopolitical risks, we mentioned Brexit, there are others, uh, the, the events in Hong Kong, watching those carefully, watching incoming data, uh, and really looking at financial conditions broadly, and we're going to be assessing those as we go into our next meeting and future meetings, and uh, what we've said is that we're, we're going to act as appropriate to sustain the expansion, and I, I, I don't have anything other than that to say here tonight. Please. <clears throat> Mr. Powell, you spoke about the diversity of views on the FOMC, and we have seen in the past couple of weeks exactly what that diversity of views means. We've had Eric Rosencrantz of the Boston Fed saying he doesn't see a need for further accommodation, yet we've seen James Bullard from the St. Louis Fed looking for an immediate 50 basis point cut in rates. How do you square that circle? How do you... Um, consider these diametrically opposed views? Well, you know, <clears throat> so I think sometimes it's easy to get unanimity on things when the path is clear. There will there'll always be questions about, um, you know, how much to do and how fast to move and things like that, but sometimes things are relatively clear. Other times it's murky out there, and you don't really, you know, there's, there's a range of views, and I think this is one of those times. Trade policy uncertainty is, is not something that <clears throat> central banks have a lot of practice in in dealing with. So as I mentioned uh, on, in other occasions, you know, we're, we're trying to look through short-run developments and, uh, and try to assess what the implications for the outlook in the medium and longer term will be of those developments. So it's challenging, and we're, we are clearly at a time where, where there's a range of views. And again, I, I, I do think that's a very healthy thing. We will, of course, reach a, a decision. I expect we'll have a strong support for, for the decisions that we made, as we, as we had in July. I expect that'll continue. But this process of having disparate views, I, I think, is, is, not, is not something that I, I feel concerned about. In fact, I, I, I think it's, it's appropriate given the, the situation we're in right now. Professor Scott. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I have a question for both of you. Um, Kind of a delicate question, I'm sorry, but that's why we're here. <laughs> um, what's the relationship with the Chinese central bank um, in these days? I mean, we, we have these political tensions, but you're technocrats and you're trying to exclude political tensions, but, but still, how, how are, is the relationship with China? And how independent is the Chinese central bank, really? Is it enough to just talk to the central bank governor, or do you, are you talking to the finance ministry all the time, or to, to other people? 
it's very, it's yeah. very hard from the West to imagine how this cooperation is really, is really working. Well, so, <laughs> you know, remember, we're not, we're not part of the government, so we don't talk about trade. It's, trade is not an issue for us. So the Chinese Central Bank attends these international mm -hmm. forums, and we have, we have discussions about the global economy, but we're not, we're not in the room, we as the Fed are not in the room on trade discussions. We're not an advisor to the government in any way. That is not the case for the Chinese Central Bank. They are, they are, they are part of that conversation in China. So we're, we, don't, we don't see that part of the world. Um, but I mean, part of the reason of having these international forums is that even when there are difficulties, there are places where we can, talk, we can sit down and hear what's happening in each other's economies. But again, we don't cross the line into what governments, there are issues that are consigned to elected governments and we don't comment on those. We don't take part in those. We stick to the things we're responsible for, which are stable prices, <coughs> maximum employment. Uh, so that, that's how I think about mm -hmm. it. I fully agree, but let me just add one thing. I think all central banks among each other have relatively good uh, um, relationships, and we have very good relationship to the Fed, but of course also to the Chinese central bank. And this is very important when we are meet in Basel you have to get a really good view about the global economy. This is maybe the most important element of monetary cooperation. So you do never take uh, the same decisions or coordinate decisions, but knowing exactly what is the economic situation in China or the US helps everybody else to understand uh, the situation. And this is much better. It limits spillovers and uh, spillbacks. So we have this relatively open exchange of views so that we have a good grip on the situation in Asia, in America, in Europe. <clears throat> so this is a very open dialogue, and I think this is what, something that developed extremely well during the last uh, couple of years. And this is exactly because we are not part of the government. So we are technocrats, and we can have this open I issue or this open dialogue there. Governor Powell. You mentioned that you've been working on a new monetary framework in the United States, and I was wondering whether uh, there is also an international dimension. You've been thinking also about an international monetary framework. I mean, are you happy with the way that the international monetary system has been working? Are there any thoughts about contributing to something new? Has Tom, does, does Thomas have any ideas on the international monetary side? So this is the first question. Mm -hmm. And the second question concerns the Phillips curve. From your comments, you said uh, things are uh, very good in labor markets, wages are going up, and we're just hoping that inflation is going to go up. Is this just wishful thinking about seeing the return of the Phillips curve, or is there some deeper reason that? Sorry, so the first question was... Um, yeah, no, the, our review is not about, um, you know, returning to um, a different international monetary framework or even, you know, having a global currency or anything like that. It's really about our domestic tools in, in our domestic context. So, for example, we're, we're looking at strategies where um, there would be a makeup for inflation below target. This is an idea that's been around for a couple of decades. The idea is that if, if inflation is meaningfully below target for a sustained period, then the central bank would communicate so that people understand that, that there will be a makeup period, meaning a boom. Of, of inflation above target, and if the public understands and acts upon that, it'll actually limit the, the damage from the recession. And it's, it's a great idea. The, question, the, the reason no central bank has really done it is it's hard to find a way to, to implement it practically. So we're looking really carefully at those ideas. That's a classic idea that we, we need some of those ideas to, to work at the zero lower bound. Um, I'll talk about the yeah. Phillips curve briefly. You know, we. Um, so there was, um, 50 years ago, there was a close relationship between the level of slack, for example, the level of unemployment in the economy and the level of inflation. That has gone away really, uh, it's, it's still there, but it's a faint, faint heartbeat. It's, but it, it, it's, uh, it's not what it was. And there are a number of possible candidate reasons for that. One of them just is that central banks and, and have kept inflation under control so much so well for so long now, really, particularly the last 25 years, that inflation expectations are well and truly anchored, and therefore inflation doesn't go down much when the economy's weak, and it doesn't go up much when the economy's tight. And I think that's, that's really where it is. 
there's always a question of, is there a steep portion of the Phillips curve? Have we, for example, have, is, is the problem not the slope of the Phillips curve, but that we've, we've, uh, we've got the wrong estimate of the, of the natural rate of unemployment, for example? Maybe the labor market's not as tight as we think and we'll, it'll get tighter and suddenly we'll hit this steep Phillips curve. Haven't seen it, haven't seen any evidence of it. I don't think we know the answers to these questions. I think that's why I think we have to use a huge dose of common sense and risk management in, in our policies. I, you know, in terms of the global, the, the international monetary system, I, I would say I think that the system of, personally, I think the system of floating rates along with a commitment from central banks not to, uh, to, to target their domestic economies and not the, the exchange rate itself as such is, is working broadly. Um, I don't know, Thomas, no. I'll stop there. No, well, I'm not sure, but probably you are alluding to the fact that we have also a dollar dominance in the international monetary system. And uh, there is sometimes a discussion about that, but this is the result, I think, of the economic dominance of the United States and in financial markets. And in fact, you can only change that if all the regions gain in economic importance, otherwise you cannot order that. Uh, this is something that has to evolve. And it's a fact that uh, uh, we have uh, also a banking system globally where dollar funding remains one of the dominant funding sources. And as long as this is uh, the case, the dollar will be by far the most dominant uh, currency. And this even increased uh, during the last couple of years during the financial crisis. And this will only change once uh, the, the economic importance of Europe will become bigger again. And then uh, the, the uh, other currencies may also gain importance. But uh, uh, otherwise, I think it's very, very difficult. This brings me to a point that for emergency situation, the liquidity distributions among central banks is something that is absolutely clear. So the swap agreements that exist between all major central banks is really one major element of this safety net of the international monetary uh, system. Over there. We have to cut soon, but maybe two or three questions. If you put <coughs> short questions, you also get um, slightly shorter answers, okay? <laughs> Governor Powell, if I understood you right, uh, you are very happy that the inflation in the U.S. is around 2%, and it was somehow a target. I also learned that uh, Japan was trying to get inflation up to a certain degree unsuccessfully. On the other hand, I hear from uh, the National Bank that price stability is prime. But somehow I have the feeling Europe is not very successful to get inflation up to a certain point, and many other countries maybe are looking also at that. Would you have a recommendation how to get the inflation to this 2%, which would be healthy for balance sheets for the future, for credit, for lending? A recommendation for, for Europe? No. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, presume to make, I, I will just say that, you know, we, um, we have inflation which is just below 2%, and it seems to be um, bouncing around between 1.5% and 2%, and you would think 11 or 10 and a half years into a, an expansion with historically low unemployment and strong growth, you would think that inflation would have been more kind of symmetrically around 2%. It's not mm -hmm. the case, so we're... we're, we're um, we, we, we're, our, our strategy is to avoid this problem of, of having inflation expectations slip down. Because once you're on that road, it's, it seems to be hard to get off it. But I, I wouldn't presume to offer any advice to Thomas or to our ECB colleagues. Maybe somebody from the students group? Nobody daring to do that? Here. You. Please, with the black shirt. Well, this, you got one there, though, too. <clears throat> Mr. Jordan, why don't you give every Swiss citizen 500 Swiss francs and you printed 100 Swiss bills? Um, because that would uh, help um, the consumption and um, it would lower the Swiss franc. Oh, yes. It's a very good idea. <laughs> And if we could, we, do, we would do it immediately. 
but it's against the Constitution, against the law. This is not foreseen that we give gifts to uh, the population. This is not something that makes sense. And also to say that in the situation that we are at the moment, ideas like helicopter money, etc., doesn't make really any sense. So we are in a situation where unemployment rate is 2.3%. The growth is something between 1% and 2% on average over the last couple of years. So this is relatively a good situation. So when we give you 500 Swiss francs, then somebody else comes to we would like 1,000 Swiss francs. We have a good project for this or that, etc. And at the end, these are not decisions that should be taken by a central bank. This is something that is really political and has to be uh, in the parliament or by the government taken and not by a technocratic uh, central bank. So giving away money for free, giving, a, giving it as a gift, this is really a political decision and not a uh, decision that should be taken by a central bank. Okay, here is the last question. Yeah. No, sorry, we give it to the lady. Excuse me. Yeah. Ladies first. Sorry, next time. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, Mr. Powell. I'd like to ask a follow-up follow -up about the Libra project and the Fed's working group that's tracking the project. Um, when you mentioned the burden of proof that falls on the project, can you speak at all to how the association has been meeting this burden of proof? What further input you've received in recent months? Um, and how you feel it should fall within the regulatory scheme? scheme? Um, and finally, um, speaking to your coordination efforts with other central banks, is this something you and Mr. Jordan have been discussing at all on this visit? Yeah. On Libra, there's not a lot I can add. You know, we do have a working group among all the financial agencies in Washington, and I think, um, uh, you know, I assume there are lots of things going on around the edges where, where we're discussing, and, but, but I, honestly, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, speculate on that. Uh, in terms of coordination, you know, I, I would just echo that we, we come to Basel, um, it's central bank to central bank, it's all about the economy, it's not about any of the political issues, and um, sometimes it's about monetary policy, and, and you know, it's, it's very fair in Basel to, to question each other's approach to monetary policy and that kind of thing, so it's a, it's a great forum. Uh, Thomas is, of course, right that the, that the swap lines that, 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 that we, we use, the dollar swap lines that we have with many central banks, were absolutely essential in the financial crisis. And um, those are the kinds of things that we can do in, mm. in collaboration. And, and it's greatly aided by the fact that, uh, that we know each other and, you know, we're, and we're, we're comfortable working with each other and in regular contact. By the way, the same is also true of the elected governments. You know, with, with the, there's the, the G20 and the G7 and so with finance ministers in the room, there's a lot of international coordination that goes on so that people do know each other and, and are just talking, which I think is a very healthy thing. Okay, your last question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Governor Powell, um, this morning, uh, again, you were mocked by President Trump in a tweet. Um, do you find the constant criticism from the president, does that make your job easier or more difficult? And <laughs> how, how, do you, how do you manage to tune this out? So, we're completely and totally focused on our jobs. I, I think, just to understand, I, I feel like the, uh, the Fed's a very important American institution. We have, the things we do affect people's lives. And um, we're gonna focus on using our tools to do the best job we can to achieve the goals that Congress has given us under the law. That's all we're gonna focus on. We don't get involved in, in other things like that. So um, that's our entire and total focus. Wonderful. In you, we trust. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Pleasure. One moment, please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Before, before we proceed to present your gift, which is a tradition at the Swiss Institute, I would quickly show the next uh, evening, coming soon in October. Um, here it is, Robert Kagan, famous writer, columnist, also from the United States. So the discussion will go on, and you are more than welcome. Also, Bob has been 
here before. Now, Governor Powell, it's always very challenging to find an appropriate gift for such a distinguished personality. And it's actually the second time we present a similar gift to somebody. Normally, everybody gets a different one. For 10 years now, imagine, we have a selection of 150 gifts already. <laughs> and this is sometimes really hard to find it, but uh, we, do our, we try to do our best. Um, this gift was also given to your, if I may say so, Chris, uh, colleague Christine Lagarde huh. when she was here and it didn't hurt any harm. It is an <laughs> economic spelt um, ah. of high Swiss quality. <laughs> so you see, <laughs> if, <laughs> if the economics go harsh, you have to press. And if it's fine, you lose it, but you also lose it if you eat a box of Swiss chocolate. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Uh, this was an absolutely outstanding evening. We have almost 2,000 people in different rooms. It was transmitted. And um, I only can say, whenever the opportunity appears that you're here in Switzerland, we do sports together, or you visit together with Thomas, the CIAP, thanks again also to Thomas, and the Swiss National Bank, this cooperation is so solid as Switzerland's ours can be. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks for the bell. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Good fun. Are we done or are we sitting down? Again?